I now have the uh, privilege of introducing uh, Professor Rebecca Sachs. Uh, Rebecca actually got her PhD also from MIT in 2003. Rebecca is currently an associate professor in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences, and Rebecca is really best known for her work uh, on a brain region specialized for theory of mind tasks that she may tell you about today. And Rebecca's topic today, she's entitled her talk, The Brain as Mind. So with that, uh, Professor Sachs. Hold on. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much for being here. It's really exciting to be back at TED Tech Day. So uh, I'm going to actually sort of start where Josh uh, left off and, and take us a little more towards the brain. Um, and I'm going to start with an apocryphal story. This is a line attributed to Alan Greenspan when he was head of the Fed. He's supposed to have said, I know you think you understand what you thought I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard was not what I meant. So to the extent that that made any sense to any of you, you were using two really amazing, hu um, potentially human unique capacities that your brains have. The first one is the capacity for language, the capacity to see the way that a, the structure of a sentence works, to put the pieces of the sentence together. And famously, this goes way beyond knowing what the sentence means, as you probably saw there. And, and as you can also imagine by thinking about how can you tell that in Lewis Carroll's example in Jabberwocky, "'Twas brillig and the slithy toes did gimble in the wabe." You can tell that that's English. How can you tell that that's English? Or, or Chomsky's famous example, this is from MIT, "'If I say colorless green ideas sleep furiously, that's meaningless, but you know that it's right. If I say colorless green idea sleeps furiously, you know that's wrong. So how can you tell the difference between those two sentences, even though neither of them make any sense? So that's one capacity your brain has. And the other one, um, which Josh already started talking about a little, is the ability to think about thoughts, right? So what Alan Greenspan is talking about is not just anything, but specifically the content of somebody's mind, what you're thinking, what I'm thinking, what I meant. And this capacity to consider other people's thoughts is something we use all the time in our lives to figure out other people's motives, to know what they don't know when we're teaching them, to know what we want them not to know if we're deceiving them, or what we want them to know if we're flirting with them. And in particular, as one example, my lab studies, we use this to make moral judgments. And so just to make sure you're all awake, I'm going to get you involved in an experiment. I'm going to tell you a story which comes from one of the experiments that we run, and I want you after the story to make a moral judgment about the character in the story. Her name is Grace, and I want you to use your hand to say, how much blame does Grace deserve? Where this is a lot of blame and this is a little bit of blame. Everybody ready? Okay, so in this story, Grace is on a tour of a chemical factory, and there's a break in the tour and she goes to get coffee. And while she's getting her own coffee, somebody else on the tour says, could you get me a cup of coffee as well? So Grace goes to get a cup of coffee for herself and for the friend. Now next to the coffee machine is a jar of white powder, and this jar is labeled dangerous toxic poison. So Grace thinks it's a chemical from the chemical factory and would be dangerous to eat. In fact, it's just the sugar that the scientists use every day that they, it's their little joke. Grace puts the powder in the coffee and gives it to her friend to drink. Although, of course, because it's just sugar, nothing happens. Now, how much blame does Grace deserve for putting the powder in the coffee? Which is good news. You're mostly safe to have coffee with. I think there's coffee in about five, half an hour. OK, now here's a different version of the story. The story is the same. Grace is on a tour of a chemical factory. She stops to make coffee. Next to the coffee machine is a jar of white powder. It's labeled sugar, and it is sugar, except that it's been contaminated by a dangerous, toxic poison. And so when she puts the white powder in the friend's coffee and gives it to the friend, the friend drinks the coffee and dies. How much blame does Grace deserve for putting the powder in the coffee? OK, and so what you guys have just done here is pretty astounding, right? What you've just said is that the first Grace who did nothing, deserves more moral blame than the second Grace who killed her friend, right? <laughs> and that's just to show you how incredibly powerful is our ability to think about other people's thoughts. So when I first got here at, to MIT as a graduate student, I was interested in studying how does our brain do these amazing human capacities like language and theory of mind. Um, I started out studying a population we call typical human adults. They're MIT undergraduates. <laughs> um, and 
one of the things that we've learned from this is that both of these capacities turn out to depend not just on our brain as a whole, but also on specialized sets of brain regions with specific functions for putting together pieces and language and for thinking about other people's thoughts. Um, the parts of your brain that are specifically necessary for language are on the left side along the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe. Some of you will know this from the um, devastating consequences of left side stroke when you can have damage to the left frontal cortex and lose the capacity to either speak or understand speech. Interestingly, your ability to think about other people's thoughts is on the other side. It's above and behind your right ear. And this brain region is the one that when we look at activity there, we can predict what you're going to say in response to the grace scenario. And as Jim said in his introduction, part of what blows my mind when I think about these ideas is it's just so amazing to think about these incredibly complex and potentially unique human capacities as the functions of these assemblies of cells and molecules. And now we know something about where they are. But then after I graduated, I left for, for, as a postdoc. I came back a few years later as a faculty. And one of the things I did was add a new question to the set of things I wanted to know. So not just how do our brains do this, but now I wanted to understand how do our brains get that way? So what happens, you start with a human infant, what happens during the, the biological and environmental development of a child that makes their brain have these functions. And again, you can think of these in terms of kind of the classic opposition of nature and nurture. You can think, what is the role of biology, of the preset plan that our genetics give us of how our cells will develop and where they'll connect to? And what is the role of environment and experience? How does how do our brains use the environments that they're embedded in to learn the language that we're hearing and to learn about other people's minds? Um, and hopefully many of you know that whenever anybody poses a question as nature or nurture, the answer is always both. But we want to go beyond just saying both and to, to figure out really more specifically what's happening in there because we start out with a collection of neurons not that dissimilar from the neurons in any animal's brains, which is part of why my colleagues can learn so much about the human brain by studying neurons in the brains of monkeys and rats and zebrafish and sea slugs. But still, if you take those neurons and put them together in the particular package of the human brain, you get a pretty distinctive and remarkable package that can do things like language and theory of mind. And so both, I want to understand how that development works just as a deep and awesome problem in basic science, but also, again, because we think if we understand the basic process, we'll be able to use it for applications like understanding developmental disorders that affect language and social cognition, um, like autism. So we need now a way to study the function of the human brain. Um, now, we've had 100 years of neuroscience, most of which involves you cut a little hole in the skull, you open it up, you stick an electrode in, you measure the activity in there. And they don't really let us do that even with MIT undergrads. <laughs> um, and so what we needed was a way to safely and what we call non-invasively, that is without cutting any holes, study the function of a brain that's inside your head. And so since about uh, eight years ago, since actually exactly when I got here, We've had at MIT and the building across campus our own, what we tell the kids, this is our brain camera. It's our own MRI machine, which we use to study um, safely the function of the human brain. Um, this is me about to be scanned. That's my brain, which looks OK. And the basic idea here is that we can take a picture of your brain like this. That's like a static photo. It's like a photo of your face. It shows us where the parts are. But what we really want is more like a movie. We want to see the changes in activity over time as you're thinking different kinds of thoughts. So what we're measuring is something called the bold signal, the blood oxygenation level dependent signal. Basically, the idea here is when a brain cell really gets going, like a muscle, it starts to use up oxygen. And then your, your blood says, oh, we need oxygen over there, and starts sending oxygen to wherever the brain cells are really going. And so what we can do is watch the oxygen move through your brain over time. So as you're listening to a sentence like the one I started with, I know you think you understand what you thought I said, what we can do is see in your brain where is the oxygen being sent as you're listening to different parts of that sentence, and then use that to figure out when are different bits of your brain being used to solve the problems we're giving you. OK, so that's the first thing we need is a brain scanner. And this is our brain scanner decorated for a child visit, visitor. 
Um, but the other thing we need in order to study development is we need uh, willing participants, willing child participants. And we've been really fortunate that over the last five years we've had a few hundred children come in and let us study their brain. Um, many of these are uh, kids of, and grandkids of alumni and faculty and staff, so if you know a kid with a great brain, feel free to get in touch. We try to make these visits as fun as possible. Any of you who've had an MRI know that doing an MRI involves lying really still in a dark tube that's making lots of noises. It's not inherently necessarily fun. Um, so we try to make it fun. We give them practice in our practice scanner where they get to listen to the sounds and get used to what it's like. Um, sometimes we give them practice what it's, how you use a brain camera to take a picture of a brain. So one of the things I used to do when I was doing these was I would tell the kids I didn't have a brain and ask them how they would figure out whether I did or I didn't. And usually we decided they would have to take a picture, so they would take me in and put me in the scanner and take a picture and check that I did have a brain. They always came running in, you do have a brain. Um, but <laughs> one of the kids actually cunningly came up with the idea. He decided to try a behavioral experiment before he did the MRI experiment. He said, what's three plus four? And I said, eight. And then he didn't know, did that mean I did have a brain or I didn't have a brain? <laughs> One of the things that's amazing about this experience is how much the kids le learn about the scanner. This was after the end of the day. We had a four-year-old in the scanner. At the end of the day, we were cleaning up. We didn't know what he was doing. He was playing with our Lego. When he came back in, he had built us a model of the scanner out of our Lego with all the parts, the scanner, the tray, the participant, the brain scientist. He had it all figured out. And fortunately for us, the kids seem to have a great time during the day interacting with the scientists and everything. This is feedback we got. She said, you have let us ha me have more fun in three days than I could have in any other place. Just think of it. I'm playing a game when at the same time I'm a research guinea pig. And who knows, I might help someone else my age if they have any brain problems while still earning money. And what do you think beats that? And she drew us a picture of herself in the scanner going buzz, beep, ding. So that's good. OK, so that's what, they, that's what they think of it. What are we doing? Obviously, we don't tell them stories about attempted murder in chemical factories. But we do want them in the scanner using their brains, doing different kinds of activities. And so we let them listen to short stories or music or watch videos where we figured out what parts of their brain are they going to have to use at different times. So for example, if we want to study the brain regions involved in language, we have them listening to short stories. Here's an example of a story a kid might hear. In the tiny town of Chew and Swallow, it rained or snowed three times each day, once during breakfast, once during lunch, and once during dinner. But it never rained rain, and it never snowed snow. It rained things like soup and juice, and snowed things like mashed potatoes. OK, so listening to that is not as, you know, it's a little more exciting than a regular MRI scan. And so these are the brain regions I showed you before, the brain regions involved in language in adults. These are the brain regions that were just going in you or are still going, hopefully, while you're listening to me talk, including this long set of down the left temporal lobe and then left frontal cortex over here. So now what happens when we get kids aged four or five to 12 in the scanner listening to the stories is pretty much exactly the same brain regions are already going in even five-year-old children while listening to those stories. We can do the same thing to try to study um, theory of mind, so thinking about other people's thoughts. Again, we have kids listening to stories, but now the stories are about characters, thoughts, or feelings. So here's an example. When Li Chi turned 10, she discovered why her friends were disappearing. They were being taken to Garberville by a lonely and selfish fairy. Li Chi felt very mad and sad when she thought about her friends so far away from their families. She wanted to do something to help. OK, and so then we can say, all right, in that story, now that story is all about people and their feelings. Over and above the brain regions involved in language, what else did you use to understand that story or the story about grace? And again, here's the picture of the activity in adults, including this region on the right-hand side that you used for the grace story. And then here's kids age 5 to 12 using, again, exactly the same brain regions. Although an interesting thing is that when we took a closer look, it suggests that though it's the same brain regions, these brain regions aren't functioning in exactly the same way. So if we look in particular at this one at the right temporoparietal junction, 
People were listening in the scanner to three kinds of stories, the ones you heard about thoughts and about the physical world, but also stories that just describe other things about people. And part of why we've argued that this brain region in the right TPJ is specifically for thinking about thoughts is data like these in adults that shows that blood oxygen is sent to this brain region really just if the story is about thoughts. Stories about anything else don't get nearly as much oxygen in this brain region. But when we looked at younger kids, we saw a slightly different pattern. And actually, in the youngest kids, what we saw is that this brain region will go for anything about people. Not any story at all, but any story about people. Anything about what they look like, or where they come from, or what they're wearing, or what they're doing. And so this looks like now reading from uh, left to right, that, um, or anyway, <laughs> it looks like this is a brain region that starts out with a general function in social cognition, doing something about people. And then over the course of childhood and adolescence, is getting more and more specialized for just this one job of thinking about people's thoughts. Still, the basic picture is that by the time we're studying these kids at age five, they have the basic pieces in place. Their language brain regions are doing language. Their theory of mind brain regions are doing theory of mind. And this fits with a kind of metaphor that neuroscientists sometimes think of about the brain is the, the brain is a Swiss army knife. That it comes prepared with multiple different parts, and each part has its own special function that it's specifically designed to do. And you might think that the implication of this is that it's all preset, that there's no room for change, that we just start with a brain with the specific functions that it has, and we're stuck with them the way they are. Um, but one of the things my lab has been getting interested in recently is evidence that that's also not true, that although we start with brains with designed for particular functions, they also have a huge potential for change. And we've started studying this by a specific example, um, which is, um, in terms of brain regions used for language, one of the things we've been studying is what happens in blind adults. Because in blind adults, they not only use the same brain regions for language that we use, they also use another brain region shown here. It's a brain region right at the back of your head, and it's the one that anybody in the room who's not blind is using to see. So this is early visual cortex. It's the brain region we use to see shapes and um, lights and color in the world. And this brain region in blind people who aren't using it to see is now been taken over by a new function. It can now, for example, tell the difference between jabberwocky and nonsense. Um, I thought that was super cool. It turns out, fortunately, the fourth graders we were telling you about also thought it was super cool. This is a fourth grader's report on cool stuff they learned about the brain when they came to visit us. And he says, people who are blind use their seeing part of their brain for language. And then, like you guys, he was asked to generate a question about the brain, and he came up with a good one. He says, I wonder what do deaf people you do with the hearing part of their brain? That was great. So we want to know now, OK, this part of the brain in blind adults that we use for seeing, and they're using it for language, how does that happen? Does it take decades of experience of blindness? Or does, um, can, does the brain start to reorganize right away? And so we needed to study blind kids. So we've started flying little kids who are blind into MIT from all around the country. These families are amazing. They come and they get to learn about their brains while they're here. And we get to learn about their brains. And one of the things that we've been learning is that already by age four, it already looks like the use of visual cortex for language is already underway. And for me as a neuroscientist, this is a little bit like watching somebody take out a Swiss Army knife to open a fine bottle of wine with the little scissors. So it seems like an incredible, amazing amount of brain development is happening in these kids before age four. And so one of the things we want to do now is figure out, OK, so what's going on there? What's the process happening in the earliest stages? Um, so one of the things we're working on right now um, is we've just started developing a special coil that will fit inside the scanner that's specially designed for human infants. This is a picture of it. Um, and we're developing movies for the babies to watch while they're being scanned. And while my grad students are working on the coils and the movies, I'm working on one of our first participants, as you can see. <laughs> so in sum, thank you. I just want to say that I hope you understand what you think I said. And I hope it's a lot like what I meant. Thank you.